Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist with an interest in all things anti-aging. And a few weeks ago on this channel, I hosted a debate exploring the long-term use of tretinoin and whether it's a smart idea to use the prescription retinoid daily over a number of years. The upshot in the debate was that the proven longer-term outcome with retinoic acid of fine line reduction means it has clear anti-aging benefits, but we talked about whether there are smarter ways to use it over time potentially using it in cycles and giving your skin a break for periods. Now, there was quite a bit of pushback in the comments to the debate from people who have used tretinoin daily for years and feel it's doing wonders for their skin. And then on Thursday, a notification popped up on my phone that popular YouTuber and dermatologist Dr. Dre had filmed a response to the debate, sharing her opinions and critique of the evidence discussed. Now, both the contributors in my debate stand by the opinions and the information they shared. Ivan Galenin has asked Dr. Dre for a right to reply on her channel. He'll also share the evidence for the points he raised. And it goes without saying that if there are ever any proven inaccuracies in any of my videos, I will always be happy to correct or remove them. But I do believe in debate, and I think it's only right to ask questions around long-term use of ingredients, medications, and devices for aesthetic purposes and to seek a range of opinions which will vary on these topics and anti-aging in general. With this in mind, I had actually recorded an interview with respected dermatologist and author of this book, Skin Intelligent, by Dr. Natalia Spearings, who takes an evidence-based and common sense approach to skincare. She also watched the tretinoin debate and I was keen to share her thoughts with you in the interest of balance. In our conversation, she shares advice around strength and frequency of tretinoin use, which I think adds a lot to the discussion. The other thing I wanted to talk to her about was hyaluronic acid, which is what we begin the interview with because it really is everywhere. And for a while, it just seemed like it was the thing to have in your skincare routine and generally layer onto your face in whatever form you could. That was until some dermatologists started to question just exactly how good an idea it is to apply it topically to our skin. So let's take a look now at what Dr. Natalia has to say on skincare's big two. Dr. Natalia, thank you for joining me. I um, really enjoyed your book, Skin Intelligent. I've, um, I've talked about it on the channel before as, as something that just offers sensible, evidence-based advice and it resonated with me as someone who feels that we probably should be more careful about what we load onto our skin on a daily basis. When you think about all the devices and the hundreds of ingredients and actives and they're all hailed as the next best thing and our heads as consumers are just absolutely swimming. So thank you for bringing some sense into that. You're whole. welcome. So with that in mind, I did want to talk to you today about um, one of the most hyped ingredients in modern times, which is hyaluronic acid. Um, and it is in just about everything. Why do you think it has emerged as one of the most used and marketed ingredients? I think it's come from the use of hyaluronic acid as an injection. So everyone always wants to figure out how to do something that you can do with an injection or with surgery without having an injection or surgery. So basically non-invasive. Um, and I think it's come from that, that we know hyaluronic acid can do pretty fun stuff if you inject it into someone's face or other areas. Um, so to try to transfer that and also what hyaluronic acid does in the skin. So there's always this kind of thing like, can we put more of something that's already in the skin that does a good mm. thing to the skin in there to do it better? You know, so that's always that idea, like taking vitamins, for example, is a similar kind of idea. Like if I just overdose on, if I do more of these vitamins, will I therefore be healthy? The same thing with um, skincare. So I think hyaluronic acid, the, similar to ceramides, that has kind of the same story, though we don't inject ceramides, um, the same ingredient story, I think. So the, those two things. So the one is the injectable world and the other is, well, it's already there. So surely if you have more of it, it just does good things. <laughs> so. Yeah. Exactly. And there's a lot of that actually, isn't it? Just just keep piling on more and more of it and you'll get you'll get more of an effect. And actually sometimes we might be doing the opposite. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the science that you've looked at, um, what does it tell us about topical hyaluronic acid? So not a lot. So um in my <laughs> unfortunately. So in my book, so I spent about four years researching this book. So I did have to keep going back to check if there was anything new about certain topics like hyaluronic acid as I was writing it. So um, there's, I've only written, and I was, I looked at my book earlier today and I'm looking at now, there's only 
like literally one full page about topical hyaluronic acid. So considering how ubiquitous it is within skincare, that's not a lot of like word time, but there was not much to say. So basically um, I did write in the book and you, you might, you probably read the page 150, 151, there have been no randomized controlled studies confirming a positive long-term smoothing effect on skin or wrinkles from the topical application of hyaluronic acid. Because you yeah. asked me about controlled trials and I was like, well, there aren't any. And how they how it seems to work is very similar to how like Vaseline works as an occlusive. So it just creates a barrier to water loss um, and just sits there, just like more, all moisturizers do. So the idea that um, there's a difference between high and low molecular weight and they do different things and something's absorbed by the skin, something's not. Again, that's not really well evidence based either. There's an I I reference one clinical study that talks about looks at examining um, hyaluronic acid penetration into the epidermis, which is the top mm. layer of the skin. And it wasn't a great study. It was unblinded and uncontrolled with a very small sample size. So basically it was a bad study, um, but it's the only one that we have up to mm -hmm. this point. It showed that both high and low molecular weight hyaluronic acid in a cream did not penetrate the stratum corneum. So it doesn't matter if it's high or low molecular, it's still too big of a molecule um, to get in there. So though it's not, so my like bottom line with this was, it's not harmful to use it because it's in everything anyway, but it's never, it's nowhere near as amazing as everyone <laughs> as it is so yeah. I think it's almost come to be in most people's minds a given like that's the thing that you need to have in your skincare mm -hmm. as if there's this huge volume of evidence behind it um so it's, it's interesting actually to hear there is so little actually there to be fair I wouldn't expect there to, hyaluronic acid is a cheap ingredient right and mm -hmm. it's a great seller so you put you put the label on it says hyaluronic acid in it. It's somewhere in the ingredients list, somewhere around there. If someone actually was going to bother to look at it, so we know it's somewhere in there, and you're comforted by that fact. Um, and you know people buy it anyway, so it's well marketed. Why would any company bother doing a randomized controlled trial that has any significance, like with enough people in it and so on, to actually show that this does anything? There is just no reason. They make hundreds of millions of pounds anyway these companies they don't want to waste their money they're, they're better off spending it on marketing and packaging and making the product look pretty than trying to prove to you because you're you know we're going to buy it anyway just like vitamin c like there's no point in doing any more research on vitamin c because everyone's already buying it anyway so um no one's going to be it's going to be unlikely that even if one really good trial came out showing that hyaluronic acid does absolutely nothing it's not going to change consumer behavior it's just not going yeah. to it's already you know, out there I mean, it is one of the frustratings in the skincare industry, I've got to say, that, um, you know, there are only, there only seem to be these short term studies and we don't know how things perform longer term and we don't know how things interact on our skin. And so you get everybody and their mother quite literally sometimes hypothesizing about layer this, layer this, do this, add this, and you're going to get a wonder result. Um, I mean, as a dermatologist, um, and, and you've done a good job with this with the book, but where do you begin um, with patients on that who are coming to you with, um, you know, they're they're layering all kinds of products onto their skin. Um, what what what's the evidenced skincare in your view? Yeah, so this is this is where my cons my initial consultations with patients are like can be up to an hour long because it's about <laughs> like working backwards and kind of they people bring me their bag of stuff and then they put it all in front of me and they, they explain to me how they use it because they've been to like five different estheticians or whatever who sold them all these different products or mm -hmm. they read it online and bought it from god knows where so anyway they bring me all this stuff and so i spend most of the so after i know what they want to get out of me then i kind of figure out all right let's step back and see why these don't work well together and then what you do need to do to get to where you want to go because by the time they see me and they have their bag of stuff they're very frustrated i yeah. mean if you go so far felt and dermatologist about your general skin health your facial skin health that means that you're very upset about what's happened you're very frustrated and you want it fixed you know that's because most the majority of people just would just keep buying more stuff from sephora in the hope you know mm -hmm. that something would would for their mild pigmentation or whatever. So if they're coming to see me about this, then it's it's really, they've been pushed to the edge. So then I have to take them away from the edge and backtrack and explain why this stuff doesn't work. The book's been really helpful. So um, I, I've been able to give people the book and say, just read this chapter and you'll be fine. Um, but so, and usually they also come to me, not just because they're frustrated with the fact that their problem hasn't been fixed. Usually it's things like crepiness or pigmentation, if we're talking like co more cosmetic problems, but also because they may have developed problems with the products. So like irritation, they've developed yeah. a perioral dermatitis that comes 
nose or their face always stings whenever they put even water on their face now. And they're not mm-hmm. sure why that is. I mean, these are common things I come across like, oh, now I can't wear sunscreen at all because any sunscreen I put on my face stings. So what sunscreen should I use? You know, and it's like these kind of you build up these problems because the more you put on your face, the more irritating everything is. Um, how I deal with that is trying to help my patients understand what they've done with all these products, which is of no fault of their own. No. Right. Uh, you know, absolutely not. And, but then say, okay, let's, let's drop everything and let's just start again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Use them on your body because most facial skincare products can be used for as body moisturizers and stuff. So that's, mm-hmm. that's fine. Um, and then, then targeting their problem. So um, using the correct treatment for whatever the, the primary concern is, whether it's acne, fine lines, you know, wrinkles, pigmentation, and then getting my patients to completely stop using virtually everything. So I, 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 I like advocate a very simple approach to skincare and, and minimal. So I call cosmetic skincare adjuvant therapy. So like you, you use it alongside your treatment or your medical treatment um, to support the medical treatment, but it's not a treatment. So moisturizer supports your use of, for example, tretinoin, but it's not a treatment for wrinkles. You know, even a salicylic acid cleanser will not treat acne. It is not a treatment. So it is a Mm -hmm. help. So you don't need salicylic acid cleansers if you have acne in general, because they don't do anything anyway. They just irritate your skin. So it's it's like just everything should be very simple. Let the let the treatment do its thing and let's not allow any of these other products to interact with that treatment in a negative way. And the kind of treatments, because we're we're straying a little bit, but I'll I'll be there'll be so many questions. What do we use for acne then? You're you're talking about a prescribed um a prescribed topical medication for acne. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ones. Some of them for acne specifically, you know, some some of the -the over-the-counter products are actually quite good, like benzoyl peroxide-based products, if used correctly in the correct patient, you know, can be very effective for mild acne. Mm -hmm. Um, Salicylic acid as well, like in a gel form, can also be very helpful for someone with mild acne. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm talking about mild acne. I want to come on to retinoids in just a moment and and tretinoin in particular. Um, But a a last um, question on hyaluronic acid, because... Looking around um, at, at some dermatologists' uh, views on this, there, there have been a few quite prominently on, on YouTube saying that they would avoid it. And one of the reasons that they give is that they think it could actually dehydrate your skin in the long run because if there isn't enough moisture in the atmosphere that it's that's drawing to your skin, it's going to take it from the lower surfaces. Um, potentially sort of damage the skin barrier that way or dehydrate your skin. What do you think of that theory? I think it may, it sounds plausible, but I think in reality it doesn't happen because no hyaluronic acid product is a pure hyaluronic acid, even though on the label it may say 100% hyaluronic acid, they still have loads of other stuff in them. So you, you, I don't know anyone who applies a pure hyaluronic acid. I don't think you can buy a product like that, basically not mm-hmm. as far as I'm aware. And you wouldn't apply it like even filler in you know, hyaluronic acid filler is not pure hyaluronic acid. So it has anesthetic in it. There's other things in there. So I think that that is p- potentially trying to scaremonger in a, in a weird way because you, you, but you do lose water through your skin all day, every day, like, you know, 500 mils a day or whatever in a normal, in like normal humidity. Um, so obviously less when it's more humid, but I don't, I mean, I've never seen that as an issue, like with using the more hyaluronic acid you use, the drier your skin is. That does have that can happen with creams, which is maybe where the confusion is, because anything with water in it, when you apply it to your skin, the water will evaporate out of that product. And that in itself can make you feel like your skin is dry again. All hyaluronic acid products, weirdly, also have water in them, which yes. doesn't really make of sense because <laughs> don't the molecules absorb water? So why does the bottle have water in it? And I never yeah. understood this. Um, I'm not a chemist, so maybe I just I'm missing something. Um, so I think I think that's where the confusion lies. I think a lot of stuff is much less potentially harmful than potentially people make it out to be. Mm-hmm. Like I'm very kind of I'm not blase about things, but I also am kind of moderate, and I won't say anything is really terrible, and I won't say anything is really generally great either. Yeah, because nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think there's a point in being like, oh, hyaluronic acid is dangerous. It's certainly not dangerous because if it was dangerous, it wouldn't be everywhere in the market. So, yeah. Let's move, if we can, to um, tretinoin because 
Um, I mean, it's such an interesting one and um, it is for many people a, a total wonder product. But I had a debate um, yes. recently on the channel, um, you know, with a skincare founder, he's got a background in inflammation research and pharmaceuticals and then a, a doctor who specialises in aesthetics now. And I mean, really, the idea behind it was just to sort of probe it a bit more and throw up some questions because we often just don't question things just sort of keep applying them day in day out for years and one of the terms that came out uh, that one of the points that came out was really the unknowns around long-term daily use of tretinoin and whether it's a good idea just to keep using it day in day out relentlessly and um i mean you take a balanced view in your book um, you take a balanced view clearly on all things, which is great. You flagged in the book that the evidence is clearly there for improving the appearance of fine lines, you know, and personally, I have found it to be really effective for skin smoothing, pore size reduction. I know others find it helpful with sun damage and pigmentation to some extent. But then there are these big claims that are regularly thrown out there that it thickens our epidermis and boosts collagen production and that continues over time. And then, then, then when you look at the longer term studies, it actually seems that the, that thickening returns to a baseline over time. So I, I would just be interested for your, for your kind of overview take on it and whether you are convinced that long term daily use without breaks is, is the best idea for our skin health. I think that one's the easiest one to answer. <laughs> so let's start with though. So, yes, I do think it's the best thing for long term skin health to use it long term. And that's, it's partially come from just looking at either the kind of the, the bigger kind of retrospective, not trials, but looking at patient populations over time. But the, the, so for me, the most important thing when I, when I think of something, does something work medical, medically, or does something, is something effective for a certain indication? Yes, I look at the papers. Yes, I look at the data. Yes, I look at the numbers. But the most important thing to me is what I see in front of me. I'm a clinical doctor. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a you know a scientist per se. I I only care about what actually works in reality. So really, that's what it comes down to. So yeah. um, if something working well on someone, then I'm like, okay, well, let's look into that a little bit further. And the the I'm only I'm 41, so <laughs> I don't have personal experience of using tretinoin for 30 years or 30 plus years. But my mother does. I read that. Yeah, <laughs> my mother is 71, so she's been using it since she gave birth to me. So uh, since I'm well, she gave birth to me when I was, when she was 30. So for like um 40 years, and my mother has better skin than any patient I've ever had. And she doesn't do anything else. She's never had Botox. She's never had anything. She's scared of needles. She won't let me touch her with a Botox needle. So <laughs> she's like, absolutely not. I'm like, okay, mom, free Botox. Um, but she says no. So, uh, and she doesn't use any fancy cosmetics. She's never had a facial. She's never had my radio frequency microneedling. And she has really fantastic skin. Granted, partially that's genetic. But my mother is also a ma massive sun worshiper. Massive. Mm -hmm. Like that's always been. Yet her, she's never um, had a facial skin cancer and her skin looks very good. So, and it's, her skin is healthy and, and she has no crepiness that's associated with aging skin. I mean, I looked at my mother's skin more and more critically over the years since I've become a dermatologist, <laughs> really kind of picked her face apart without her knowing um, and just thought, now you have better skin than a lot of my 50 year old patients do. And I do think it's because of the tretinoin use. I think what's interesting, I can see sort of two camps with it. I think there are some users who it just seems to work absolutely brilliant for and it's like their skin keeps up with it. You know, they're keeping up with the race. I used it for about 10 months and saw a lot of benefits from it. Really one of the most beneficial things, if not the most that I, I, I've used. But um, my skin just was struggling to keep up with that 0.05%. Um, I would be just regularly dry. And so I've stepped down for it, from it for a bit. You know, and I'm, I'm getting the benefits. My skin's a bit better, better hydrated. I'm just using a retinal, retinal to hide. But I'll probably go back and I might just go yeah. back on that 0 0.025. Um, yeah. And maybe I might not use it every day. And I think that's kind of what I'm pressing into. It's like, I think some people with tretinoin, just because there are some really uh, great looking advocates of it, who's clearly working for it and their skin's keeping up with it. And then I think the rest of us look at that and go, that's what I've got to do, despite my skin going, hello, help, you know? 
Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm struggling here. Um, and I wonder if it's just the messaging could be finessed around it, that if your skin's struggling to keep up, you know, use it less frequently, step down in strength, take a break for a while. It doesn't have to be every day. Yeah, absolutely. And after, and the, the, you know, the research and the biopsy studies do show that after for the first six to 12 months of continuous daily use, so if you're really consistent, um, you know, you'll get all these kind of uh, changes within the, the biopsies, like your, um, you know, stratum granulosum gets thicker, your stratum corneum becomes more compact, those things change again after about 12 months. So then you have these things that are actually actively changing, but they seem to stop and go back to baseline at around 12 months, but then the skin still sh shows the improvement in the fine lines and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. So yeah. So yes, then you have a peak, and also the sun sensitivity goes away after six months of continuous use as well. So things they get worse and like they get better, kind of what you've experienced mm -hmm. potentially. Then your your positive results kind of stop. You plateau, in effect, which is potentially yeah. worse. Mm -hmm. yes, plateau, and then. With those people who get there, then I'm like, all right, well, I want you to use it. Try to use it every night, and I'll I'll bring the dose down as far as you need to be able to use it nightly because it's easier for people to use something every night than it is to use it three nights a week, just from a co compliance perspective. And yeah. then people like using something every night, so that's fine. But if that's not possible, then I'm like, well, just three nights a week is fine because once you've gotten through that first like year ish of treatment and you've seen the benefits. Um, though it may take you more than a year to get there because if you can only use it three times a week or whatever because of you know irritation issues, then once you get there, then we can start reducing it down into using it just a few nights a week. The evidence base is for anything above 0.02%. It's a real controversial area too. Like, do I need to keep pushing up in strength? Do I have to go from 0.025 to 0.05 to 0.1? No, you don't. And I, I strongly feel that you don't have to, though I cannot prove that with a paper. So I can only yeah. say that from just clinical experience. So um, no, you don't. People, you will see results even at a low strength if you're able to tolerate using that. If you only use it once a week, that's probably not going to be enough to get you there. Yeah. With my patients, because I use a compounding lab, so the um, the tretinoin that I prescribe is is made per patient on a like on a strength that I want to give them, basically. Mm -hmm. I can do this finessing where I say, okay, well, I think you're going to be a little reactive. So let me whack it down to 0 0.01 and add in a 0.5% hydrocortisone to your cream for the first three months, maybe make it into an ointment rather than a cream to see if that will help as well. Um, and then get you to use it twice a week only and then build it up slowly. So certain people, like, Certain people I will know will have a bad, well, not bad, but they, they won't tolerate it basically. So, you know, we want to build it up slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really helpful um, because I think, I think probably in my own situation, if I, if I go back to, I'm just going to stick to that lower strength and, you know, yeah. still get the benefits, but keep up pace with it. Yeah, and only use a few nights a week. I mean, I think one thing that was talked about in your um, in your podcast with those two people was that uh, it thins the skin. Um, that retinoids thin the skin, which is which is something I hear a lot, and mm -hmm. I I don't know why where that's come from, but I think it's just a misunderstanding of the stratum corneum becoming compacted doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's getting thinner. It becomes more squished together, which is a good which is what makes your skin feel kind of smoother and softer. It's exfoliation of the, the those kind of surface. Yeah. drifting cells yeah, exactly that's not thinning of the skin so thinning of the skin is usually associated with like topical steroid use so that there's this whole fear around this atrophy but thinning of the skin in terms of steroids refers to dermal thinning so that's the dermis literally getting thinner and yes that does happen with long-term steroid use but it's also quite um uncommon because people never generally have to use topical steroids in a high strength for a very long time like months to years consistently to have that effect um so yeah, there is that misunderstanding about um, tretinoin and the safety over many years. I mean, it's it's perfectly safe to use. Uh, the FDA license doesn't stretch out to years and years, but that's because for FDA approval, you don't need more than like a year worth of data. You know, nothing is approved for like 20 year use because we yeah. have no, you know, there is no FDA data. But we have data about that for tretinoin, but not, it's not given to the FDA or the yeah. MHRA. Thank you very much for, for lending us your expertise. It's much appreciated. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you.